Welcome to the Risk Experience Podcast. In today's episode, we will be discussing open banking and APIs. The concept of open banking has been around since 2013 when the European Commission proposed an amendment to the Payment Services Directive of 2007 in what has become known as the Payment Services Directive 2 or PSD2. Among the directives contained in PSD2 was the opening of bank data to third parties. This was aimed at creating a more integrated European payment market. In fact, on October 8, 2015, when PSD2 was officially adopted by the European Parliament, Commissioner Jonathan Hill, responsible for financial stability, stated that this legislation is a step towards a digital single market It will benefit consumers and businesses and help the economy grow. In the same forum, Commissioner Margaret Vestager noted that the new directive will greatly benefit European consumers by making it easier to shop online and enabling new services to enter the market to manage their bank accounts, for example, to keep track of their spending on different accounts. So, today we want to delve into the details of open banking and the role of APIs in its development. Joining me for this discussion is Matt McLady. Matt is a software architect and a global leader of API strategy at Millsoft, a Salesforce company. It's good to have you here, Matt. Thanks very much for having me. Thank you for joining. Sure. All right, let's begin with an understanding of open banking. So what is open banking? Well, I think you hit on uh, a few of the points up front, and and it is a a little bit hard to define. Right. Because as all industries are going through this whole digital transformation, you know, there's there's these labels we come up with, and in, in the tech industry, we're famous for this. We'll come up with a label and start slapping it on everything. But I think... I think the multidimensional, you know, the best way to simplify it is really that um, in the digital economy, we have this opportunity to open up new channels of engagement for consumers. And in fact, I would say, you know, they get used to new channels of engagement. And so this is really the banking industries look at accepting the reality that, hey, we're going to be opening up all these new channels. Let's make sure that the banks are going to are going to play well in that mode, so that as a consumer, I can um, access my banking information through whatever various uh, digital channels there might be. Um, and I think the reason you know there's there's other aspects to it. Uh, open banking is often just considered the realm where banks open up their services through APIs. So a lot of banks, when they talk about open banking or just thinking about what APIs they can offer to the outside world. And I think there's the very specific regulatory definition, uh, which, as you cited, you know, was really led by the European standards around PST2, which is saying a specific set of services, banking data, account data, as well as as well as payments initiation and payment services, opening those things up. But I, but I think open banking, conceptually, it, it's more about just how can how can banks and consumers uh, fulfill their their financial services in this new digital landscape that we have? I see. That's a great explanation. With reference to the speech by Commissioner Vestager that I cited in the introduction, can we also think of open banking this way? Mm. Suppose there are two financial institutions that have both adopted open banking. The customer would be able to just log into the account with one bank, and they would be able to see their financial information from the other bank through an API, giving them a comprehensive idea of their financial situation all in one place. Is this the case? Well, that's one scenario. So, okay, you know, it just, if we look back at kind of where this started from, um, the regulations were really, I think, something that came out of the, the, the big churn around data rights and data ownership. And in the banking world, you know, I, I, I would even argue, you know, open banking even in the scenario you described, goes back as long as we've had online banking. Right. And maybe even longer, because I know there were online banking services that could allow you to do certain functions between between banks and transfer money or check balances and so on for a while. And there's been third-party providers like Yodely in the U.S. And, and Intuit accounting functions and so on that have been able to directly plug into banking services. So that's been around. But I think I think the the real driver for this movement towards regulation and open banking was was really to determine who owns the data. Precisely so. And, and a firm statement, at least in Europe, to say that that banking information belongs to consumers. It's it's their account information. It belongs to them. They should be able to decide who can 
who can have access to that information. And I think a big push that came along um, about 10 years or so ago or you know, and has really been coming to a head is that there are these aggregator services out there. Um, Visa just acquired a company called Plaid uh, for like $5 billion uh, earlier this year, right? Right. There's a lot of, of value, perceived value in just aggregating information. And so, you know, it was really, hey, we know this is going to happen. It's inevitable that people are going to be sharing their information. So let's let's try and come up with regulations that will will uh, force them to do it in a responsible way. And that's where where I think APIs come in as the responsible way of doing that. But uh, but the scenario you described, where you might have, if I'm banking at one bank, can I connect to my banking services at another bank? You know, the the groundwork is laid there by the by the standards and approaches of open banking, it's still ultimately going to be up to those banks, though, to decide what types of services they put in there. Right, I see. So does the name open banking suggest that all these are limited to the banking industry or it transcends other industries such as insurance as well? Well, from a, uh, from a regulatory perspective, you know, regulations usually happen industry by industry. Um, but the trend towards this openness and these digital ecosystems of multiple players uh, being orchestrated for for a uh, a very new pleasing digital experience, you know, that's across every industry. And and I would say there are some industries that have probably evolved even more quickly than banking on that front. Uh, insurance, I think, like I think it's a really exciting industry when it comes to. Uh, the digital opportunity because insurance insurance is an entirely data driven industry and it always has been. Right? I was actually I have a six year old and I was I don't know how we got on the topic this morning but I was trying to explain insurance to him. Right? <laughs> try and try and put the notion of insurance into a six year old's mind. Right. But re- but but when you break it down to that level, you think you know it's just about data. It's just about saying. Uh, you know, I'll, we'll take on this risk if you pay us this amount of money and then doing the number crunching. So, so we've seen the insurance industry evolve with, by, you know, especially from a data standpoint in the last couple of decades, post web um, auto insurance providers who are offering instruments to measure individual driving habits in order to give discounts on, on, on their payments because they can get better data, more accurate data to predict driving uh, likelihood of of claims coming in. We've seen uh, life insurance providers start to partner with fitness uh, players to collect information about exercise and nutrition habits in order to give discounts. So there's huge, like I look at all this, when we talk about open banking, you know, I look at it really as the potential of digital banking or or integrated digital banking. So definitely the same applies. And And I would say even now, a lot of the regulations in open banking are focused more on the consumer banking space, but there's there's plenty of opportunities in every area of banking, because um, banking, you know, every industry can be more data driven, and the companies, if if you take a very very high level look at digital business, right, the companies who have become the giants, Amazon, Facebook, Google, like what they do really well, better than anybody, is capture data and create value through data. Whether it's whether it's Facebook using you know uh, personalized information or or even psychological profiling to do hyper targeted advertising, exactly. Google doing the same. Whether it's Amazon collecting all sorts of uh, consumer statistics and, and making market decisions, or or even you know they they become one of the biggest tech companies in the world too. All of it all of it's data driven. So, you know, in the more data driven, like even in, in investment banking and, and other areas where, you know, data is, data is really important, you know, there's huge, huge opportunities there as well. Right. Great. That's very interesting. So let's dig into the history of open banking. How did it all start and why the need for open banking? It really was, um, you know, we're looking at the possibilities that we have, like banks, banks are interesting uh, when it comes to. IT landscapes because banking as an industry has probably been using uh, digital using software solutions 
maybe longer than any industry. Right. And so that in one sense, it makes banks pioneers. In another sense, though, it means that there's all this legacy technology that has built up over time. So I think the promise has always been there that you can connect services, banking services between banks and so on. But, you know, it comes down to what's going to be in the customer's interest, what's going to be in the bank's interest. And I think it's fair to say that banking, as well as being a pioneering software industry, is also a fairly conservative industry, right? You get big, successful banks uh, that have very successful business models. They're not as compelled to make changes the way that maybe some other industries would be with lower margins and, and lower lower revenue streams. But um, what's happened is with the you know digital disruption happening everywhere, uh, as I mentioned, the consumers are looking at, well, you know, if I can get recommendations on Netflix, why can't I get recommendations for banking services? Or, exactly. or if I can get, you know, this very high touch ride sharing disruption in my in my in my Uber or Lyft experience, hey, what about banking? Where is my how can I get a really positive user experience in banking? And so there are these companies, I think the fintechs, right? You've heard that term a lot around uh, startups in the financial services space. Right. who are looking at the way other industries have been disrupted, looking at what, you know, they usually start by looking at customer experience and thinking about how can we engage with customers in a digital way and 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 solve the problems that they have. So with a lot of those fintechs coming into play, uh, that put, I think, pressure on the industry. And I, and I think a lot of banks realize that, as I, I mentioned also, you know, it's, it's inevitable here. The change is coming. We can be um, part of the change or, or victims of the change. So that really put pressure on the industry, as well as the the pressure around data ownership and you know how can we how can we make this uh, you know how can we establish ownership of data for for consumers. So I, when I look at the you know I have a I have a sort of a balanced view. I'm very optimistic about the potential of open banking, right. but also a little bit cynical, having a lot of experience in the banking industry. That and I think it was. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Lita Glyptis, I don't know if you've ever heard of Lita. She's a big digital uh, expert in the UK who's been, who's, a, who's been really on top of what's going on in open banking. She, she wrote a really good blog post talking about cynical compliance, something that happened in the, in the European markets. In order to comply with PSD2, doing just enough compliance to meet the regulations, but still try and kind of maintain leverage in those markets. And I've seen some of that. So, so I think you know, if I were a bank going into this space, you know, I would look at the definitely, you know, you, you need to really think through uh, what the opportunity is and not just be on the defensive and say, well, we have to comply. But they, I think there are some real opportunities there because these fintechs, as I said, very customer focused, very nimble. Um, but I still think that there's the banks themselves hold a lot of leverage in this new market. Exactly. So is it also possible that regulators introduced open banking to break up oligopolies in order to ensure that there's a lot more competition in the financial services industry? Yeah, I, th I think there's definitely an aspect of that. You know, there, it, you have to kind of reverse engineer intentions. Right. Because all, all the public statements would be around making this right for the consumer. So from, this, from the sense that you want consumers to be to benefit from the regulations then certainly uh sort of antitrust flavors would would be in the favor of of consumers um and and you know it's interesting in the uk i think they had another level of regulations on top of psd2 targeted specifically at the big the biggest nine financial institutions in the uk which included not just the uk banks but actually the Irish banks operating in the UK and, and some of the other European banks with big presence. So, so there's, it, there definitely feels to be a flavor of that, but I, but I think what, whether the regulations are intended to do that or not, um, the movement of opening up banking to new players is going to do that anyway. And I think that, that what happened is these, these, these startups were, it's not like they have to wait for the open banking regulations to take effect in order to, uh, to do what they want to do, because I think the part of the part of the regulation is saying that um, once you achieve compliance, then there are certain methods that these fintechs have been using that will be sort of outlawed, like screen scraping and so on. Exactly. But 
they were finding their way in um, regardless of whether there were regulations or not. So I think it's more the industry trend that has the potential to uh, disrupt and, and maybe take away, at least take away the oligarchy that was in place, right? I think in other more mature digital industries, we've sort of seen how you know, things get broken apart and then these other large uh, conglomerates uh, arise, right? Like 20, 25 years ago, Amazon was just a, a startup selling books. <laughs> now, now, now they're <laughs> maybe the biggest company in the world, right? So, right. I see. All right. So how does open banking vary between different regions and countries? Well, there, I think it's, I think the trends are fairly consistent, but they're at different stages. So uh, like a lot of this early, what I would consider to be at least integrated, you know, open digital ecosystem uh, business models for banking and for financial services started in the U.S. Like I mentioned Intuit and Yodely, and there's there's some other examples of account aggregators. I remember I was working at a large Canadian bank in the uh, early 2000s, just after kind of turn of the millennium, and we were dealing with account aggregating solutions at that point. So that's that's not that new, and, and that's been all over the place. But I, but I think what's interesting to see is uh, the different types of focus that's happening in each region. So in in Europe, where there does tend to be more of a lean towards the rights of the consumer and privacy rights and so on, we saw that's where the, we saw the first regulations to really get in there and say, hey, let's protect consumer data rights. Um, Australia has followed suit there even more exclusively. I think their their regulations are all focused on it's it's called CDR regulations for consumer data rights, which really they're looking at starting that in the banking industry, but that might be something that's brought to other industries as well. Uh, I think that, you know, the, even within North America, you know, I'm, I'm here in Vancouver in Canada, and we have a very different banking system than, than is in the U S but the U S like the U S is, is probably been more skewed towards um, meeting customer demand and, you know, it's 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 probably less regulated than these these other countries. So it will be very interesting to see how regulatory driven the U.S. is versus how market driven the U.S. is. And I would I would say at this point it's being very market driven. Exactly. I'm working with a number of large financial institutions on you know on overseas as well as in North America, and I I, I think that the the goals are very consistent for the financial institutions. They're looking at, you know, I think they're in the right mindset rather than just reacting defensively to regulations. How can we uh, foresee what this new ecosystem driven market is going to look like and how can we be a high value player in that market? Uh, but it's just that you have different dynamics because in Europe now, due to the regulations, you have a little bit more of a baseline to work from since all the financial institutions have had to open up their services. Whereas in the U.S., it's been more uh, just just based on necessity, whether or not those APIs are even available. Right. So currently in the U.S., the only provision for sharing consumer information is contained in Section 1033A of the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act, which requires financial institutions to make available consumer information upon request by the consumer. It goes further to say that this should be provided in an electronic form that is usable by the consumer. With open banking, this widens the scope of data sharing beyond the consumer, creating the concern as to what financial information will be shared. Can you elaborate more on exactly what type of consumer level financial information will be shared through open banking? So I just, I want to kind of pick up that because I think this is a really interesting example. Um, to to talk about mindset so you get a regulation written like that and you can if for those who who work inside financial institutions right you can think about how how you could solve that requirement and it and there's a real spectrum there and a lot of times having been involved in these types of regulatory initiatives you might kick it off as some broad project with a deadline where you've got to just meet the letter of the law and come up with some like PDF reports that you come out with periodically, right? Right. Or 
you could actually reimagine your whole internal services as digital services and then think about how you could offer you know kind of user driven um data to a, to that would meet that requirement but open up new possibilities as well so i think it's uh, you know that that's the type of regulation where it's going kind to of lends itself to very narrow thinking probably whereas there's a lot of a lot of the work around psd2 and and came with a whole you know mindset approach shift but in terms of the the us- usual scenarios that we we see it's really about about consent so i think the focus of open banking isn't so much about what you can provide to the consumers themselves right it's more about what you're going to allow consumers to do to provide access to other other parties uh, for for th- you know three party four party financial exchanges i see all right so what is the role of apis in open banking so apis you know for those who aren't familiar with apis uh, api itself is a term that's been around a long time in software probably almost as long as software has existed as a way of just saying if you've got some functionality uh, you can offer a way for people to access that functionality and reuse that functionality um, and then this was evident in programming languages and platforms if you're a even now if you're a mobile developer you'll have a set of apis for writing android apps versus apis for writing iOS apps but but when we talk about APIs in an open banking context it's a it's a bigger trend really around the world wide web um, we probably most people think of the web they think about going to a browser and, and pulling up a website um, but APIs actually constitute a much bigger surface of the web than than browser based websites APIs are the digital gateways that allow companies to interact with each other. So for example, um, a company like eBay, it was one of the pioneers of opening their APIs up to the web. They were able to offer APIs as a way for um, website developers to connect into eBay's selling services, right? It was a, it was a brand new channel. Amazon was, I mentioned earlier, they they were a big API adopter where they kind of everything they do, they build behind an API, which means it can be either used to the outside world or internally. Uh, so this is kind of, a, it's it's been, you know, in inside enterprises, APIs have been used as a new way of opening up functionality to be um, composed and, and reused across different business units and different product lines. And if you have customer information, APIs inside your organization, it allows you to offer customer centric services. But they really are the channel by which organizations connect to each other digitally. Nice. And so, in an open banking, and in an open banking sense, you look at PSD two. It's about opening up account information services, and it's about opening up payment services. And for both of those, the way banks are are doing it is they're creating this API, which is some. It's actually a an address. You know, it's it's access through a a URL, the same way that you might access a website, but it's accessed really by a developer who would go in, um, learn how to use the API, what types of requests to send, what data you're going to get back, and then build a whole application around using that API, which would communicate over the open web. So it's, it's pretty exciting because, you know, it's, it's a way, this is the way the web has grown up. And so adapt, adapting it into this banking context is great. But, you know, as we're talking about risk management, obviously, once you start opening things up, you need to do that in a responsible way. Exactly. That's the major concern. <laughs> yeah, yep, for sure. <laughs> right. Well, and, and here the good news there is that once again, because we're following the evolution of the web, we're dealing with solved problems mostly in a risk management sense. So, for example, right, right I think... I can't remember if it was signing on with Facebook first or, or or what, but you know now how you can go to all sorts of different websites and sign in using Facebook or sign in using Google, so on. It allows you to do that type of authentication. That's using a standard called OAuth, which is the security standard for APIs that allows third party consent and access to to resources. 
I see. So just following the best practices of, of how the web has been integrated um, means that we're on pretty solid ground when it comes to open banking. Right. It's interesting you mentioned the adoption of APIs by eBay and Amazon. So eBay and Salesforce were actually one of the pioneers in adopting APIs in the year 2000. Mm -hmm. And then come 2002, we had Amazon Web Services launching. Yep. This went on with Google, Facebook, Twitter using APIs as well. And then it gradually found its way into the banking sector. So I believe the idea of APIs in the banking sector provided a fertile ground for the discussion on open banking to get started. Yeah, and, and you know, I've, I worked at a bank for 11 years, then I've been in the, in the software vendor side for the last uh, 13 years, but I've been very working closely with banks. And it's been, it's been a real, there've been multiple threads of, of evolution. And I see this more as convergence because um, banks, again, being early adopters of software solutions and having some of the most complex integrated solutions have continuously been looking for what are the best ways to actually get our systems to work together. Right. And they've gone through these different phases and adoption. So there was around the same time that Salesforce, I think it was at the, um, the, one of the public events talked about their API and, and, and Salesforce was a really interesting story because when they, when they launched as a new company in 2000, it was like nothing else. Like this idea of software as a service was brand new. So they really had to have a way of connecting into existing applications to get stuff migrated out to their cloud-based application. So that's what they used APIs for. But at the same time, Salesforce was launching, eBay was using APIs. Inside banks, they were looking at new web-based technologies for doing integration. So they were using protocols like XML and SOAP was a new standard at that point um, where they, they were looking at how do we connect our systems in a more uh, interoperable way, in a more reusable way and even actually those those web service techniques at that time were still looking at how do we create channels to the outside world. Some of the early examples were like stock stock uh, value exchange to just pull down stock information, ticker information. So there was the, I think the banking sector always had its foot in the water when it came to opening up channels through the web. Right. But I think this has really pushed it to say, okay, we've seen industries form on the web. You know, it's really, it's, it's safe enough now. It's needed to be able to really uh, embrace, embrace the web as, as really the exchange vehicle for, for this ecosystem of open banking. Right. So for open banking to work, do all banks have to use the same API or they could be using different APIs with a requirement that these APIs should follow the same development standard? They don't. And in fact, um, you know, it's standards are, are an interesting beast, even in Europe. Right. There's not there, even though we have these regulations, we still have variants of, of standards and variants of approaches. Um, so historically, banking has kind of uh, dashed up against the rocks of, 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 of these industry standards a few times. Um, there's, there was an IFX. I mentioned XML. When XML was new, there was a standard out called IFX, which was supposed to uh, in, you know, enumerate every every operation you'd want to do in retail banking over XML, and you know it, it's just hard to get everybody uh, subscribing to something at a very low level because it's hard to differentiate yourselves. Exactly. So I think the way that that the standardization has happened by focusing on the functions and you know really thinking around the semantics of what needs to be done is is the right way to go because if you try and standardize the syntax and, and like, you know, try and come up with a, a, a giant data model for everybody to use, you know, who's going to maintain that and who, how can you get agreement right. by everybody? So I think you have to have a level of, uh, of flexibility within that. So I, I, not everyone needs to use the same formats for their APIs, but I think at least everybody supporting the same sort of functions is, is quite useful. Right. So this is going to lead to an influx of multiple fintech startups looking to get a share of the potential demand for APIs following the introduction of open banking. Mm -hmm. Do you see that coming up in the industry? Completely. Yeah. And then I think we're already there. I would even say that, uh, you know, the fintech space, there's still a lot of room to grow because what's exciting is as the ecosystem 
expands and you get all these banks starting to play, that creates new opportunities. You get the network effect of every every new player has like an in, exponential increase in in opportunity. Um, so, but but there are a lot of well formed uh, fintechs that are already there. And, and one one of the areas I'm studying lately is is not only in banking but in every industry is these digital business models. Thinking through what are the patterns that we see. So if I look, you know, at, at the API economy, which is a term that's been around for a decade or so, um, really, you know, APIs. I mentioned some of the examples. A, a big push for for API adoption was the explosion of mobile technology because mobile apps are all built on top of of web APIs. But uh, right. there's there's a company called Twilio, which is now a publicly traded company and um, you know, worth worth over a billion dollars. They they're an interesting case in the telco industry. Right when they came to market, it was very simple, saying all these mobile app developers are going to want to build these applications. They want to use functions on the phone. They want to be able to communicate over voice over IP. They want to be able to send text messages, billing, and so on. So what Twilio did is they went to a whole bunch of the back end telco providers, all the big AT and T's and and T Mobiles and so on, and aggregated all their services and created APIs that were very developer friendly and then sold them to these mobile developers. So they built a business model just around making, aggregating and and these APIs and making them user friendly. I think you'll see some examples like that in the fintech space. And I think it's an opportunity, uh, not just for fintechs, but for, for other banks because um, Plaid, the company I mentioned before, all right. They started out, I think, as a as a startup called Sliver, where they wanted to connect into a bunch of banks and, and offer you a, a website to go in and check your account data. But as they were going through the process of building that product, they recognized how hard it was to connect into these back-end banks. So they figured, hey, if we do this heavy lifting, we could actually build a platform. And instead of instead of offering a website to consumers, we'll offer a set of APIs that other fintechs can use to to you to access these backend services, right. so that's a completely different business model than where they started. But but even now we've seen um, examples of uh, banks in the UK and banks elsewhere starting to get into the, just like those fintechs have done, start to look at customer engagement, and start to think about how can we be the front door for our for customers to look into financial services. So they might even display. Uh, interest rates from their bank and other banks, as an example, just by pulling down uh, data from other banks. So there's, I think there's a whole new, uh, there's a whole new set of opportunities, not just for the fintechs, but for the established players as well. Right. So in terms of managing the risk associated with APIs, what is regulation doing about the influx of all these fintechs coming up to produce these APIs? Some obviously more experienced than others. How is regulation checking the products they come up with, bearing in mind that these are subsequently going to connect to banks to share customers' financial information through them? I think I think there's two parts to that. So the there's the intent and the execution. Right. right? And I think I think the intent was there from the beginning, which was a really an industry wide recognition that hey, because uh, how how things were be sh- being shared before for these account aggregation solutions would be, I would go. To my account aggregator and say, I want to have a single view of all my financial products from all banks. Right here, here's my username and password for all my banks. Right, I would be giving that to these aggregators. Right, which is pretty dangerous because that can obviously take those credentials and, and, and you know it's it's just a matter of trust. Exactly. So so I think right off the bat, part of the driver for the regulations was to. To, to stop that practice, right? To get away. That's that's what we call screen scraping. To get away from screen scraping and to go to more of this API driven approach, which allows you to do the third, the you know, the three-legged OAuth authentication, which means I never give my credentials to to the aggregator. I'm only going to authenticate directly with my bank and tell them I'm giving this other party's permission to view my account information without having to give my credentials up. So that's that's you know intent was there and that's really how it's being executed. And then the other one is around just establishing ownership. If you know the principle around 
consumer data rights is no one's going to look at my financial information without me giving my consent to do that. Exactly. So that's the intent there. I think though, you know, it's the, the in reality um, that once you, once data is out of your, once you let the data outside the boundaries of your financial institution, it's very difficult to guarantee what happens with that data. Right. Exactly. I mean, you want, so you want to, so it, I think any bank who's going into open banking and looking at what APIs they expose should go through a very rigorous process of understanding what data is being exposed, um, what all the potential risks are there. You know, are there pieces, data fields that should be masked or encrypted and so on? Uh, because, you know, it's the usual. I think banks are, are pretty mature on information security, but it is a new potential uh, attack surface, right? To have have these APIs, but again, um, there's there's definitely best practices in the industry, mature tools and technology that that can help there. Right, exactly. So for the typical customer who may have little knowledge about open banking, all this may seem a bit unsettling. The fact that third parties, in particular startups and fintechs, are allowed unfettered access to their financial information poses a scary situation. Mm-hmm. Even when consent is required before customers' financial information could be shared, there's still that uncertainty regarding how the data will be shared and even the scope of distribution in terms of who may have access to it. Now, there are already a lot of unbanked and underbanked population in the world. And in the US alone, this was estimated at about 55 million in 2018, representing 22% of the adult population. Do you think the uncertainties surrounding open banking will drive existing customers out of the banking sector? I don't I don't think so because I think this at least the spirit of the regulations is still around you know enforcing consent for sharing of individual information. And but I think it's a good point from the customer standpoint, you know, I I think that that pe- nobody's going to be putting cash under a pillow these days. I think we're such a cashless society. But I you know, I look at this from from a bank's perspective, it might be fearful of, of giving away the keys to the kingdom by opening up the account information. I would look at it as, you know, there you kind of underline an opportunity. You like as a consumer, uh, I have choices. I and right now maybe my best choices are these fintech startups for doing some of the services that they provide. But, you know, from a financial standpoint, am I more likely to trust some startup that has probably their the name of the company is some misspelled word? Or, or, <laughs> or bad analogy for, you know, or will I trust my bank that I've been banking with for a long time, who maybe, maybe I've been grumpy about their customer service in the past, but hasn't, hasn't reached me, hasn't, uh, you know, hasn't gone, has, has protected my money. So, so I think that's where uh, the banks can go, really go on offense and think about how we can, you know, what are, why, why is there room in the market for these startups? Uh, you know, hey, maybe I can come up with an offering myself. Maybe I can come up with a misspelled word and create an offering out of it. Right. <laughs> right. So I think there's lots of opportunities there. Exactly. So one other area of concern is global banks. If you take a global bank with an office in the US and an office, say, in the UK, how does open banking transcend these borders? How are these global banks supposed to implement open banking under one big entity while submitting to different regulatory requirements in each region? I think it. I think it really comes down to the operating model of those banks, and I think when you look at it on the surface and think, "Ooh, you know, a big, big uh, multinational bank, they're going to be impacted." A lot of those banks are still operating in a very siloed sense, so they're very, they're already very regionally deployed. So there might be some uh, IT enabled functions that are that are global, but a lot of the times the core banking services are are actually isolated region by region. So I guess from a from a compliance standpoint, that means you know they still have to meet all the compliance needs, but it might not break as many things in that model. But having said that, you know what are the opportunities they're missing if they're already if they're still siloed along those lines. So right for, for the companies that are more globally integrated, maybe impacted more. I mean, and, and the funny thing is those UK banks, right? Even even without considering their global scope, regionally they had to go and meet 
two different regulations, one specific to the UK and, and then PSD2 more generally for Europe. So they were, already, they were already hit twice, really, within one sort of one region. But, exactly. But I think that, um, uh, you know, it really comes down to how globally integrated the, the operating functions are of the banks. But, but regardless, they're going to have to deal with um, regulatory compliance across regions anyway. I, I think that if you look at, let's say, if you're a bank that complied with PSD2 in Europe, uh, then you, I think pre-work has been done to meet CDR in, in Australia, as an example. And, and probably if there are specific regulations coming in North America, a lot of the banks I've been talking to are looking at PSD2 as the model anyway. So I suspect that that compliance would be you know, more of an evolutionary step than a brand new set of work. I see. So in this case, if you take a global bank, um, that has already implemented open banking in the UK, for example, are they allowed to share customer information for a customer resident in UK with a third party API in the US, for example? That's a good, I, the specifics of that, I'm not exactly sure. I think, I think though, it's, again, it's going to come back to whether or not the, the customer consents, right? And so yeah. I think we've always got that that safeguard in place, but, um, you know, there's, I, I think we've, we probably being in the banking space for a while, right. We've already always seen these, these, uh, these things that come up that are just really constrained by the imagination of the people writing, <laughs> writing the regulations right. Right? In, in a, in a complex globally diversified banking sector. Uh, we're going to find anomalous cases. Right. So following up on that, what is the current state of open banking in North America? So Canada, you know, here we are. I mentioned I'm, I'm up in Canada. I always feel like we're kind of right between the European banking and payments industry and the U.S., um, where the things that the U.S. is going to be first on, Canada is going to come second. Then Europe, the things Europe is first on, Canada will come second, U.S. third. I went like chip chip card as an example, right? It was something that was adopted first in Europe and then Canada and the US. But open banking is a challenging one because from a regulation standpoint, Europe's first. But from as I mentioned before, I think from a exploiting the digital ecosystem, I think the US has been first. So what I what I'm finding, I think and and Canadian banks, Canadian banking industry is is a very much more closed set of big five banks. There are some other players, but you know they tend to move together. Right. So in the chip example I cited, it was a big, you know, hey, we're all going to do this at the same time. Um, whereas the U.S., you just get it's much more dynamic with all the different banking players. So I think Canada, I suspect that there's been all sorts of talk and work already being done that makes it feel like they're assuming uh, PSD2 style regulations are, are going to be put in place. All right. And they're kind of doing it in a coordinated way. I think in the US, I've talked to a number of banks and there's a real range of opinions there. I think some banks are just at the point of saying, hey, we'll move them, we have to. But other banks are saying, look, you know, especially the more you know, global purview they have, uh, well, we know it's what's going on out there, and we're going to try and be aggressive and, and get in early. So it's a very wide spectrum in the U.S., and I think that there's, um, but I think there's a you know with such a vibrant fintech market in the U.S., there's a great opportunity to establish first mover advantage, get partnerships with some of the fintechs or even new offerings out there. Exactly. Uh, so I expect this, you know, I think, but I think it's going to be the full range of possibilities happening in the U.S. Some, some banks will only move when they have to. Right. Um, I, I, and I think it's, I think it's okay to be uh, guarded against moving too quickly. Like it, it, it really comes down to what, you know, it's much better to be intentional about entering the open banking market. I think, I think the dangerous thing to do is to be pulled into it you know, without, without thought of, of why, right? So, right. so if you've been screen scraped a long time and 
you know, you feel compelled that, oh, I have to op- offer some APIs so they'll stop taking my customers' credentials. It's probably a reasonably reasonable move from a defensive standpoint, but then you have to really think about what else are you opening up. So when I'm working with companies on their strategy around open banking, that's why I always start with thinking about the business model, which kind of goes hand in hand with what types of consumer experiences you want to support. But really, when you start to map out what the business model is going to look like, you can you can pretty like the business model ecosystem. So, you know, if we've got the consumer here and the fintech here and our bank is here and what are the competitors doing, you can get a better sense of, of who the winners and losers might be in that in those different scenarios. Right, exactly. That's a very good point, and I totally agree with you. So if you take the case of the U.S., regulators have adopted a more hands-off approach by issuing non-binding guidelines, allowing the private sector to spearhead the open banking development. For example, in a 2018 report issued by the U.S. Department of Treasury, it was noted that significant differences exist between the United States and the United Kingdom with regard to size, nature, and diversity of the financial services sector. And this coupled with existing regulatory challenges makes open banking not readily applicable in the US. So whereas two regulatory agencies are responsible for open banking in the UK, there are at least eight federal agencies that have jurisdiction over different aspects of the US financial market. And all these agencies have to be on board any such wholesale policy. So regulators are taking the stance that they cannot give any guidelines as to what banks should do. Rather, they are allowing them to take charge in adopting open banking and then regulators will come in to fix loopholes whenever necessary. And I think that's a good approach, especially when it's a gray area for everyone. And as a regulator, you may not even know what policies to put in place until practice has come into place. And whenever there are loopholes, you come in as a regulator to fix them. Yeah, it's definitely flexible. Right. I think that, you know, if I took a little bit of a cynical view, I might look at it as, you know, hey, like this is too much to try and <laughs> try and tackle. Exactly. Right. We're just gonna we're just gonna let it roll and and see where where we can recover. Um, I th- I think that actually speaks to a bigger issue, more of maybe more of a governmental issue about you know how do you regulate these new digital markets? You, it takes a special type of understanding of digital business, I think, to really exactly to regulate it. And so, and it's, and we can look at, you know, do the whole systems analysis of it and see it becomes challenging because a lot of the people who have the expertise to, to who would be effective regulators are caught up in the gold rush of opportunity, right? So it's, it's unlikely they would step away from the opportunity space and just become regulators. Right. So, you know, I, I think it, it does reflect reality though, which is, a lot of this, it's just going to be market driven. And I think, I think from a, if I were sitting in a, in a bank's shoes, I would look at that and not think, oh, okay, well, I, the regulators aren't going to force me to do anything. So I don't have to do anything. <laughs> right. I'm like, I would take it as, oh, well, okay. If the regulators aren't scrutinizing things, then chances are the, the wolves are going to, are going to appear. So do I want to be a wolf or a sheep, right? right? Like I, I would get in there and, and think about both how do I capitalize on the opportunity and how do I protect against, uh, let's say, you know, kind of taking away uh, my, my customer base. And I, I think there is a really, I haven't, I haven't talked about this much, but I think there is a real legitimate concern from the bank standpoint about their customers' information being out there. Right. And I think obviously protecting customer privacy and so on, that's, that's a given. That has, that's a very important consideration. But I think the biggest threat there is to the bank's business anyway is as soon as you have a third party as the channel of engagement for your customers, it changes the dynamic of your relationship with your customers. Right. Um, my, my analogy there is through this self-isolation period, being at home through the pandemic, mm-hmm. um, you know, I used, we used to go out to eat at certain favorite restaurants, or we might get takeout from certain favorite places. But given the you know concern around being in infectious areas and so on, we just started getting delivery delivered food more using like these food delivery services. Right, and it has comp- it's just changed my mentality around getting food from restaurants now, where 
I'm not so much thinking about, oh, I want to go to this restaurant and have this experience. It's more about, hey, just go to the go to this uh, delivery provider's uh, app and just I can pick basically pick menu items and have them delivered from wherever. So I lose sort of that relationship. And I think I think that same sort of experience could be could be coming or could be coming for banking, which is why I think it's very important to protect the direct channels of engagement. Right. So it also brings to mind the idea of banks adopting open banking at an early stage in order to benefit from some first mover advantages, especially in North America, where there are no regulations mandating them to adopt it. So if you find yourself not adopting open banking, then as others adapt and customers find more ease and convenience in using open banking, there's that likelihood of them moving away from banks that have not adapted open banking to those that have adapted it because they can have a more comprehensive view of their financial information from those banks. So there's clearly a first mover advantage, especially in growing banks' customer base. Yeah, definitely. I think, I think so let's say you aren't the first channel of engagement. Right. Um, why do consumers want that? third-party channel of engagement, one of the reasons could be freedom of choice. Exactly. And if, and if you're not on the menu, then you know, <laughs> you're not going to be benefiting from that new channel of engagement. Right. Uh, but I, and I think also, you know, being the menu provider is, is uh, it just, it just like just creating that engagement, having, that's the way dig, the digital world works, right? Like look at, look at how Netflix has evolved. Exactly. Um, and they've kind of self-disrupted themselves, but let's even take Netflix from the point where they were offering streaming services, right? It's, it's, they didn't start a film studio first, right? They, they were a channel first, uh, a customer channel and providing differentiated experience and were then able to kind of go down the, the stack. Um, a friend of mine, Mehdi Medjoui, who's a well-known in the API community, he runs a global event series called API Days. He's got a whole model of this around kind of micro segmentation of, of businesses, but it's it's talking all about inverting the approach. A lot of a lot of product companies have thought about the the products they offer and the customers of those products and so on, but more thinking about how do you just acquire customers and then these digital companies do that and then they move down the stack and offer continual you know complete complete solution offerings like Netflix running a studio and offering their own content. So so I think. You know, there's there's lots of different angles to approach this at, but again, it comes back to uh, understanding the consumer need and consumer experience. Right. So, what should financial institutions do to prepare for open banking? Well, I think there's there are a number of things that they can do. I, I think you know, I, I work for for MuleSoft, which is you mentioned off the top part of Salesforce. MuleSoft was acquired a couple of years ago, and we we really built a business around helping organizations, uh, not just not just connect their their applications and data, but do it in a certain way. And so we talk about an approach called API-led connectivity. And what that means is if you build your system components, um, services, data uh, behind APIs, you end up with a very composable set of services, which will allow you to be more agile and and, and offer your services to multiple channels and 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 just kind of an, anticipate better how digital experiences are going to work. So I, so I think companies need to think about how um, modular their their services are from a digital standpoint. How effectively can uh, can you um, offer up? Think about your products and account services. How how able would you be to open those up to to digital channels? So I think working on that is a is an important task. And I think that's something that kind of falls to the IT team in general. But I think from um, from a business standpoint, really, again, going back and thinking through what are the new business models that are going to emerge in a digital banking ecosystem, right? All right. How are we going to be a wholesaler of banking services offered out to a number of, let's say, distributors, like, you know, playing the role of retailer, in this digital world, are we going to focus on being a retailer and owning the customer engagement? And then if we are, maybe we play both of those roles, but how do we plug into the other providers of services? So really decomposing, again, decomposing the business model of banking away from this 
uh, monolithic organization that's self-contained to thinking about how you can be a player in ecosystems made up of multiple digital uh, companies and entities. So I think I think that type of thinking um, it's it's still new. It's it's not like we've got uh, an exact established set of patterns to follow. Right. I think that's exciting. I mean, I know a lot of bankers who might not because they, you know, they like tried and true, but I right. think there's a lot of possibility out there. But I, I think that's the main thing for companies to think about. Not to, yes, you need to be ready for whatever regulations are coming your way, but if you're if you're able to comply with regulations in a way that's going to have to open the door for a advantageous business model, then you're really going to succeed. All right, this is where we bring our discussion to an end. Thank you very much, Matt, for your time and all the valuable information you shared with us concerning open banking. Thank you for the opportunity. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Awesome. All right. Thanks a lot, Frank. Subscribe to the Risk Experience podcast and thank you for listening.